It's a pleasure for me to be with you today and to share with you uh, some of the new work that I've been dealing with for the past couple of years. Um, the work is really summarized in this diagram where we see a set of scales and um, the scales really uh, talk about two kinds of learning, assessment of learning, that's the stuff that really dominates so much of what goes on in education, achievement tests, uh, math, especially math and uh, reading, and what I call uh, assessment for learning. Now, I think assessment of learning has its value, but I would like to see more balance between these two types of learning, which I will be describing in detail as we move out move throughout our uh, session today. Uh, it really focuses on uh, promoting uh, more enjoyment, engagement, and enthusiasm for learning, what we call the three E's, and is actually the theme of our center at the University of Connecticut. And it's designed to uh, promote a, a more enjoyable and a more creative culture in the entire school. And we do this by combining uh, new work with previous work, which you'll be seeing in a couple of minutes. And uh, these th three things really relate to the major learning theory that I've developed called the enrichment triad model. And then uh, using that model to infuse enrichment throughout the entire school, the school-wide enrichment model. And these two things have also resulted in an online program because doing the kind of teaching that we advocate requires a lot of resources for teachers. And unless these resources can be found quickly and easily, we'll still be using a basically a, a one-size-fits-all uh, approach to teaching. Now, uh, this is a diagram that I begin almost all presentations with. Uh, as we all know, but sometimes don't think a lot about, all learning exists on a continuum that ranges from deductive, didactic, and prescriptive learning on the left to inductive, investigative, and inquiry learning on the right. And again, in the lower part of that box, you see JIT, which stands for just-in-time just content. That's content that may not be in lesson plans or unit, unit plans or even the textbook, but it's information that children learn how to go and get when they meet it, need it to deal with a particular problem. The focus of my work has been on the right-hand side of this, and uh, people have oftentimes asked me, what's the goal of gifted education? And I always say to increase the world's reservoir of creative and productive people, innovators, designers, entrepreneurs, people who make a difference in the world. And so I'm not arguing against the value of assessment of learning or even the fact that we have to learn our states and capitals and times tables. But the fact is that learning to apply these kinds of things in a more investigative and creative way is really what the, my work in the enrichment triad model is all about. Um, in order to understand this, you need a, an understanding of the difference between formative and summative assessment. Think of summative assessment as a test at any given uh, unit of instruction. We want to find out how much kids know. And formative assessment is information that we find out that helps us to act upon some of the kinds of things that we will do with young people. Uh, I like the quotation at the end by Hattie and Pimperlary, formative assessment with appropriate feedback is the most powerful motivator in the enhancement of achievement. And so we're trying to get more formative assessment. We're also trying to get more what I call performance-based assessment, gathering information about what students can do and might like to do and know or what we insist through a prescribed curriculum that they have to do. Uh, and uh, I sometimes refer to this as the pursuit of real problems. And you're gonna see some examples of what I call real problems as we move along. So um, I, I always like to begin uh, with this quotation by Donald Campbell. I've used it many, many times. Uh, it's 
better to have imprecise answers to the right questions than precise answers to the wrong questions. And we can't measure some of the kinds of things I'll be talking about as precisely as we can give a percentile of a child's third grade math score, but nevertheless, they become very important. And so, again, the idea is developing over the last couple of years, and that's what I'll be talking about today. I'd like to start with four important questions that we all need to ask ourselves as we go into any process of change. Change ain't easy, and so we have to know where we stand if we want to get to someplace different. Uh, the uh, first question is, what is the biggest challenging challenge facing the fields of gifted education? I don't think there's any argument about the answer to that, and that is the underrepresentation of low income and minority groups. And I will add to that with equal importance, kids that may not make it by a given cutoff score, but have something going for them that we can uncover by looking at their assessment for learning rather than assessment of learning. And these are just some news, news articles that have appeared over the last couple of years uh, where there's lots and lots of talk about underrepresentation. I've actually got five pages of these slides of just newspaper reports. You'll see a few more as we move along, as in the next slide. Question number two, what are the possible outcomes if we don't find effective ways of addressing this challenge? And here we see things like, for example, New York sweeping suit over NYC school bias calls for disband of gifted and talented programs, and uh, an article from Champaign, Illinois district to propose phasing out elementary level gifted programs. So our pro programs are really in, in some danger because we can't solve the underrepresentation problem. Here's some good news that I picked up in one of my blogs. Uh, the St. Louis Park School District would extend gifted and talented programming to all students. And this is what we will uh, discuss uh, as we move through uh, the school-wide enrichment model. Um, question number three, what needs to be added to universal screening and local norms to make a difference? People that are talking about uh, underrepresentation are saying, well, let's use universal screening, which by the way, we do in most states. Almost all kids take state achievement tests. Um, and uh, that's a good thing. Uh, the, prob the problem is we're only screening for a certain segment of a child's potential. So advocates who recommend universal screening and the use of local norms continue to depend on cognitive ability and standardized achievement tests to make, uh, to, to identify youngsters and make necessary adjustments. Uh, there are many exogenous factors uh, in underrepresented populations that are the reason that these young people simply do not do well on these tests. And down at the bottom here, we see a list of exogenous uh, factors, parental care, nutrition, early childhood experiences, you know, poor schools, all of those kinds of things really lead to uh, what again, are called exogenous factors. So if we don't look for other kinds of things than what we already know they're not going to do well on, we're not going to be able to move ahead. Question number four, and this is an important one, and I've written a couple of articles on that. Uh, I'll give you my uh, LinkedIn account at the end of this if you want to search for any of these. How do we use the G word as a noun or as an adjective? As a noun, it's, it's the entity position. And there's no, no synonyms for uh, uh, the G word uh, in uh, the dictionary for as a noun, uh, other than one might guess things like blessed or preordained, uh, but they, they don't really cover uh, the idea that some kids are gifted and are and always will be, and some are not and never will be. The de developmental position, which I've written a good deal about, I use the word as an adjective. I don't talk about the gifted. I talk about gifted education programs and services. So you see it there 
as an adjective and synonyms frequently found when it's used as an adjective are superior mathematician, advanced reader, innovative designer, exceptional artist, etc. And so I'm trying to also uh, change the culture a little bit as, the, as to the way we use the word. Uh, this next slide is based on something that I developed in 1978 called the three ring conception of giftedness. Uh, I must say that it was not greeted with a red carpet when it first came out. As a matter of fact, uh, all of the gifted education journals rejected it. And I finally had it published in a general ed journal. And I say today with no amount of modesty that it's the most widely cited article in the field. And what this theory talks about is the interaction between and among three sets of traits that lead to what I call gifted behaviors. Again, notice the word there uh, is being used as an adjective. One person after my article was published even wrote an article called Rinzuliitis, a national disease in gifted education. So I'm very happy that this article uh, has done well over the years because it means the field is changing its mind in a, a little bit of a way. We've already talked about formative and summative assessment and the difference between the two. So I'm going to skip this slide and move on to what uh, this approach is all about. The uh, difference between of learning, basically scoring well on traditional tests and assessment for learning is looking at things like enjoyment of learning, interests, learning styles, executive functions, collaboration, cooperation, all of those kinds of things that I believe are important in the repertoire of young people, especially in today's rapidly changing world where high level executive positions in almost every field is looking for these kinds of things just as much as they are looking for students uh, grade point averages and rank in class when they graduate from college. I also talk in my work about two types of assessment. One is called status information, and that's anything you could put down on paper before you even meet a child. You, you know his or her scores, his or her teacher ratings, things like that. Action information are things that you could only document when they are happening or after they happened. So we're trying to identify strength-based characteristics that will facilitate future learning. Again, you saw them in the previous slide, creativity, motivation, learning styles, et cetera. And uh, one time I was asked, how do we measure action information? One of the things that we've included in our wor work is a thing called the action information form. And it looks like this. Uh, these are ordinarily sent from one teacher to another or sometimes an outside mentor or resource person. And to give you an example, I'm a big four example kind of guy. Stephen G is driving me up the wall. His new idea is to produce a solar car. He has already drawn 10 plans and collected research about solar energy that is extremely advanced. So when the resource teacher in the, our school-wide enrichment program received this, she invited this uh, young person in to work with her, even though he wasn't a officially identified gifted student. And she also got him many, many resources, including some adult mentors. And he eventually further developed his car and actually entered in the state science competition. So again, uh, a summary into practice, a sample of, uh, of learning instruments that we've developed over the years and, so, and you see the light bulb there, teachers fill them out, and even kids and parents can fill them out for that matter. But we're looking for the kinds of things that students complete as uh, sources of input. And uh, we've developed many, many instruments in these areas. To me, having an idea isn't worth a dime unless you can get it into practice. So over the years, uh, my colleagues and I have developed uh, instruments uh, interest assessment. You'll see some examples of this in a minute. Learning styles assessment, uh, expression styles. Tell me how a young person likes to express herself or himself, and I can do something great with that young per per 
person by working backwards from there. He likes or she likes to draw cartoons. All right, let's get him some how-to books on cartooning. Let's see if a local cartoonist might want to work with this young person. Uh, so let's look at a few examples of these questions. Uh, this is just from our, our interest Eliza. Pretend your class is going on a field trip and you are in charge of picking the places to go. Check off three items from below. Museum, sports game, music concert, uh, firehouse, mayor's office, TV studio. And it goes on, on and on uh, like that. Um, we have a, pr a primary edition of this. Um, we've also developed a separate uh, interest Eliza just in the area. Let's ask children what kind of books they like to read. And then instead of always using the primer, let's let them make some choices. Uh, the, uh, this, is, this next one is a little bit more graphic with some figures on it. This is one for primary age students. Uh, these are some questions from our learning styles and inventory. We ask youngsters, do they like to participate in a game that tests their knowledge and material they've learned? Do they like to share ideas with other students during a class discussion? Uh, talk with other students about a topic of interest. And uh, the uh, most recent in that series is an instrument that uh, asks questions about expression styles. Uh, we gave it the name My Way after the Frank Sinatra song, I'd like to do it my way. And uh, here, all of these instruments have gone through a, a, a rigorous research project. There you see some of the data that gives us the factors that the, are analyzed by the instrument. So here are, are uh, just a few examples from the uh, a, a, a very recent instrument uh, called the executive, executive function scale. I think that we've uh, retitled it all about me. It's still going through a research project. And this scale is based on a organizational piece that I developed after uh, a couple of years of research looking at all of the major categories and sub factors that people are looking at when they study executive functions. Again, which have become much more important even in college admission. That's what uh, people that read admissions letters are looking for. Has the person done a community uh, resource project or have they helped out at a uh, senior citizens center? Have they written anything uh, to, uh, to express a particular point of view? Um, six things you can do with assessment for learning. First of all, create a strength-based profile or portfolio for all students. Second is modify the role of teachers from the stage on the stage, the sage on the stage to the guide on the side. Form an enrichment cluster program. I'll be going over these things individually as we move along. Gain access to how-to books for teaching authentic investigative skills and teach young people the investigative and data gathering process. You'll have copies of these slides. Uh, I'll send them out to your or, uh, conference organizer. Now, this could be a uh, paper and pencil uh, portfolio, although I must say that it does result in a lot of paperwork. And that's where a new program that uh, we have uh, developed uh, called the Renzulli Learning System, an electronic technology-based program, which you'll be hearing more about comes in. Uh, I know what you're thinking. Give me a break. How can we accommodate all these things? I've got 26 kids in the Ministry of Education and a curriculum to cover. And hit, there you see the teacher hiding under the desk. Well, let's take an example from people who have been very successful, like Google and Microsoft and Amazon. Do you know that almost every couple of days I get a personal letter from Amazon? Hello, Dr. Joseph Renzulli. Now, how do they know what to send me of the billions of products that are out in the world? Very simple. They have my profile. They know what I have purchased in the past. And so they will send me like-minded like books or furniture or food or whatever I, I choose to buy. Now, one of the things is that, again, Gathering this information in paper and pencil format 
is very time consuming. And so we did develop this program, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. It's called the Renzulli Pro Renzulli Learning System. And what this does is it has youngsters answer a series of these questions about interest, learning styles, etc. And these are analyzed by a computer, and they the result is that they produce a student profile. This is one for Valerie, a sixth grade girl. And uh, this is how we overcome the paperwork problem in this process. And so the analysis of this by the computer points out Valerie's three strongest interest areas, her three best learning styles, and the three ways in which she would like to express herself. But let's let Valerie tell you about this herself. I sometimes think that when kids tell the story, it's always better. Valerie Stickles, and I'm a sixth grade student. I am one of the people who tried out this from Julie Learning website, and it was a really great website. We, I got my profile back, and I am one who loves poetry, and I just, I really love poetry, and it, on my profile, it actually said that I loved poetry, and so whenever I went on to my critical thinking or books, it was going to be all about poetry. On some poetry websites, they actually let me submit my work to um, contests and everything, and I got to, I haven't heard back from them yet because it's supposed to take a few weeks, but I can't wait to hear back, and so I'll hear back from my own email address. And I'm going to stop it at that point because of time, but just to tell you a little bit about Valerie, that was when she was in sixth grade. By the time she graduated from high school, she had uh, about a dozen poems in local and uh, national uh, magazines, some for children's poetry. Uh, she went on to become a teacher at, of poetry, and uh, we still stay in communication. And when I ask her about, you know, why did you go in this direction, she traces it right back to some of the projects that she did when she was using this program. So here's how the instrument works. There's a tool for personalizing uh, curriculum instruction called the Strengthalyzer, where we look at the items you see on the left, and we're adding new items, the executive function scale. As soon as we finish the research, that will be going in there. We're actually putting in a school climate inventory and even a school happiness scales. Happy kids learn better than unhappy kids. Um, this is where the real beauty of this system comes in. The computer reads this profile, and then it scans through a list of 50,000 highly carefully selected enrichment resources, no worksheets online or text online, and it picks resources just for Valerie. And I believe that um, this use of technology is the only way that we can break loose from the, the one-size-fits-all curriculum or the common core state standards that have dominated uh, so much of our education system. So if you go to the website, www.renzulilearning.com, you'll find uh, all kinds of examples. You can try it out. And by the way, I did not name the program. It was developed with uh, $10 million of investment capital by the University of Connecticut. And then when it was all done, uh, they uh, uh, paid Sally and me a nice royalty, and it moved on to a private company. So uh, again, here is just some examples of some of the kinds of things. Now, this next slide, again, is a theory into practice slide. And what we've done is use the three-ring conception of giftedness and the enrichment triad model to build into uh, the, <clears throat> the Renzulli learning system dozens of, these are just a few examples of type one activities, uh, type two activities, and type three activities. And so, again, theory doesn't have value to me unless you can put it into something practical. So I move on to the, the next uh, uh, issue, and that is modifying the role of the teacher. There are two very different roles uh, for teachers. We all know the role of the teacher as an information giver, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I believe that if you're going to use this pedagogy, the enrichment triad type of pedagogy, then one of the things we've got to do is at least have part of the teacher's time 
in the role of guide on the side. And a great deal has been written about this, but I want to tell you one story about it. And it's always easy for me to work with teachers of the gifted, but uh, in the school-wide enrichment model, we're trying to work with the general population. And, you know, I walk into a room of 150 uh, middle grade and high school teachers and say, we want to change what you're doing. They look at me like I came from some other other planet or galaxy. So I developed this activity and I'm not going to do it with you today, but you're, self, you're welcome to use it if you would like. I put up these things on the, uh, on the screen uh, and I asked the teachers to raise their hand if they've ever been part of anything related to sports, to science, math, technology, written, oral, visual, performing arts or extracurricular activities. And I asked them to put their hand up as I put each of these three, uh, four slides up on the screen. And when they're done, I say, wow, man, you guys, some of you had your hand up two or three times. And in your role as the, the soccer coach or in, in your role as the uh, faculty advisor to the school newspaper, you're being more on the guide as the guide on the side. I then ask them three questions. What I'm trying to get is they already have these activities. They're just not allowed to use them in a prescriptive curriculum. And the questions are who came? And they always say, well, kids that were interested in soccer versus kids that were interested in chorus. What did they do? Not what did they learn? They always presented something. They performed something. They wrote something. They did some service activity. Then the real payoff question, what role did you play? That is you, the teacher. And these are things that I compiled. I've done this with many, many groups. So over the years, I compiled a list of the most frequent answers. And here you see on the screen, I'm just gonna put them all up. Librarian, taxi driver, press agent, general consultant, advisor, shoulder to cry on, fixer. I asked the teacher what that meant. And she said something like a lawyer, you know, that we, we want to use the copy machine in the office, but Madame Defarge, the school secretary, will cut your arm off at the elbow. So we bring her donuts and we schmooze with her a little bit. And the next thing you know, we can use the copy machine. So I've got a lot of great stories as I question teachers on uh, their responses to some of these questions. And what I'm trying to get across to these teachers that are not gifted, talented, card-carrying specialists, but regular general classroom teachers is they've got these skills by all of the show of hands. And you're certainly welcome to use that if you want to try to uh, turn around a faculty. Uh, now, uh, uh, item number three uh, from that should be, uh, I'm sorry, form an enrichment cluster program in your school. What we found in uh, developing school-wide enrichment models in schools is this is a good starting point because it gives the teachers a chance to where this brand of learning is on the front burner. The first rule of, of the enrichment clusters is there are no lesson or unit plans. There are startup activities, mainly type one enrichment. Bring in a speaker, show a video, take a field trip, have a discussion. Uh, they come together during regularly scheduled time blocks to pursue, again, a product, performance, publication, presentation, some form of artwork or community service. And so you'll then go and get, this is where just-in-time information comes in, you'll go and get the kinds of tools and resources that you need. And these are the kinds of things, again, that we tried to build into Renzuli Learning. This is where the interest Eliza becomes a very valuable item. Uh, start with two or three exciting tech one, type ones that show what professionals in a particular area do. And there you see a list, Disney Channel, Discovery, again, visiting speakers, field trips. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Uh, next, uh, brainstorm three formats that the final product might take. For example, will it be something constructed, published, presented, displayed, or some kind of social action? I love this uh, cartoon. These aren't just any old doodles, Ms. James. They're, no they're notes for my graphic novel. Uh, that's where in uh, expression styles comes in. And again, here we see a, a breakout of the many, many different ways uh, that people express themselves. Uh, 
The next one is really uh, something my family accuses of being in greater love with than I am with them, but they're, they're first. And that is what we call how-to books. When we talk about giving young people the investigative skills to investigate a topic, there are literally hundreds of these books. We have a whole separate database on the how-to books in Rizzuli Learning. One of my very favorites in all the world is the Student's Guide to Social Action that you see there, where it teaches kids how to do uh, community projects and social action projects. Uh, just an example, make movies, start a business, build bridges, write stories, it goes on and on. And so, um, at my uh, lab at the University of Connecticut, I have a whole separate section section of our library that is just how to do books. I'm sort of obsessive about collecting them myself. Um, there's, believe it or not, there's even a how-to book on how to write how-to books. Um, look for places. This is the product outlet audience goal. Look for places where student work can be published, presented, displayed and brainstorm, uh, where would you like to send this? Do you want to send it to a, a your, your science project to a local newspaper or the state science contest? And so kids like to start thinking, feeling, and doing like the practicing professional, even if it's at a more junior age, let's say, than an adult scientist or a filmmaker from Hollywood. They're doing what the big guys do at a more junior level. And this is where all those kinds of skills that we talk so much about in gifted education come in. Now, the next one uh, is for uh, a guide on the side. After a few cluster meetings, teachers should never be talking to the whole group more than a third of the time. Their role should be advising, giving feedback, suggesting uh, human resources, print digital resources, and thank goodness for the internet because so many more resources are easily available uh, to young people today. We move on to the uh, item number four, promote en enrichment infusion into the regular curriculum for more personalized learning. And I must tell you that this has been my biggest challenge. Uh, Working with gifted teachers is a pushover compared to working with a general faculty that already feels overwhelmed by regulations and prescriptions. So I've developed an activity and um, the activity is called an, a curricular infusion activity. And I use this thing, this little uh, uh, baker's thing. I always ask the question, uh, how do bakers get the jelly in the jelly donut? And that's uh, sort of my metaphor for infusion. And what we've developed is a thing called the creative idea generator. And it works like this. And these are examples from schools I've actually worked with. I asked a group of teachers, uh, what were the two most, um, these were uh, middle grade teachers, uh, what were the two most memory-oriented things uh, that they teach? And they came up with a list, but the, the highest on the list were U.S. states and capitals and multiplication tables. Then they were divided up into groups, and I asked them to try to think of ways that they could make those two topics more interesting. And here, um, and I, I know you can't see the small print here, but in 10 minutes, they came up with 22 different ideas, and um, they sent me some of them over the next uh, several months. Uh, this is a state that they have to sing the state song uh, at once a month at an assembly, and they hate that song worse than the devil, the devil hates holy water. So they actually came up with a rap song, and they sent me a, a tape uh, that, that was the rap song that the kids came up with. They also, uh, a group of kids invented a matching game where they would give a, a, an item of importance from a given state. Like, for example, where was the Frisbee invented? And you draw a line from Frisbee to one of the, I think that there are uh, uh, 10 states on the five forms of this matching. And the kids had so much time because guess what? They were re researching these states. By the way, the Frisbee was invented in Connecticut. Uh, so, uh, here again uh, is uh, one that a teacher sent me uh, that she uses for uh, brainstorming historical topics. And she uses 
Are they interested in the people, the period, the events, the places, or any other thing? Uh, one, uh, one group of kids was interested in fashion, women's fashion, during the Civil War. So that's, uh, th they were actually able to fill in that bubble. So uh, this is uh, a, a bulletin board that uh, one teacher sent me as well and allowed me to use as an example. Uh, the historian, she got the uh, information from a how-to book called The Historian as Detective. And there you see uh, some of the kinds of things that real life historians actually do uh, in their work. Uh, here's one from science, and it's a, a how-to book on earthworms, and it's questions raised by students about organisms. And here we see many, many different kinds of questions that kids can uh, do if they're interested in, in uh, scientific research, if they can do uh, individual uh, research on. Uh, and here's one, uh, making nonfiction from scratch. And uh, that's the table of contents of the book. And it teaches kids just how it's written by people, with a lot of experience in nonfiction. And so um, these are the kinds of things, sample problems focusing on questions uh, for students interested in earthworms. And uh, uh, that slides slightly out of order. It should be back following that other one. How does light affect earthworms? How does moisture affect earthworms? Are earthworms sensitive to touch? And these were all things that kids learned some investigative techniques. Now these next slides, and I could show you 30 of these, but these are again, all of the areas, some of the areas in which there are how-to books, a student's guide to conducting social science research, uh, how to make scientific projects science projects, scientific, um, easy, uh, easy design, plays for young puppeteers, how to make pop-up books. It, the list just goes on and on. Again, here we see the social action book, the kids business book you're going to hear about um, in, a, in a later example. The next item in uh, enrichment clusters, and again, the pedagogy that we're trying to get into the classroom is teaching young people the investigative process. And uh, in my lab uh, at UConn, the University of Connecticut, we have all these bins that you see on the lower left. And in each bin, there's an instrument. The instruments are listed at the upper right. And what we try to do is teach teachers how to use the instrument with young people. And then when they're all done, they ask a question. Now that you know how to use this instrument, what are some things that you might like to investigate? Uh, by the way, two of my colleagues and I uh, did a, a book on this that's available from Proofrock Press. I'm not trying to sell books, but if you want to teach kids about these instruments, we have all kinds of great activities. So let's take a look at an example. This is a bacteria test beater. And what you do is you put some uh, powder on your hands First, everybody has to wash their hands to make sure they're all the same degree of cleanliness. What does that mean? The same water, the same temperature, the same amount of soap. So everybody's hands is the same. Then they go out and they touch different things. And then they use this to get a reading of what kinds of uh, bacteria or germs are on their hands. So when the teacher taught the young people how to use this, this is, this is excellent is an actual example, they decided they would like to go out on the playground and touch commonly used things to see uh, the amount of bacteria. So these are some of the pictures that the teachers sent me. Uh, they're touching the handle on the overhead rail, the uh, railing on the playscape and the seat of the slide. So conclusion, uh, I love this quotation and I don't know who it's from, but if we always do what we've always done, we'll always get what we always got. And uh, thank you for that kind of pause. Uh, it's more com it, it is more complicated. Is it more complicated than simply drawing lines between cutoff scores? The answer is absolutely yes. Will it take more time? Yes, unless you use the technology-based version. And 
will help us identify more young people with high levels of talent potential? And the answer to that is yes. And our research over the years has really shown this. We've had some kids, as you're going to see in the next couple of examples, that are remarkable. Uh, this next example is a school that I work with in New London, Connecticut. It's an old seaport town, and uh, it's about 80, 80%, 85% African American and Hispanic. And they started an enrichment cluster uh, called Night of the Notables. And uh, the it was completely the teacher's idea, and she wrote up a nice little description what famous people are you interested in? Why are you interested in them, et cetera? And uh, this is a little boy named Kenyon who's play, uh, portraying Guillaume Bluford, the first African-American astronaut. And what each person did was they gave a two minute presentation. They went to other schools, they did a parents night, they even did the board of education, which by the way, yielded a lot of results for supporting their enrichment program. And then they went to their stations and you could go to their station and ask questions because they had to study that person, anticipate the most frequently asked questions, and then they would uh, actually portray that role. So here is the uh, kids. This was over two separate, uh, the, the, this cluster was done twice. And so the first row and the second row are, there might be a little bit of overlap but uh, these were the, the kids, the p famous people that the kids uh, chose, and they did marvelous research. They read biographies, autobiographies in some cases. They looked at some things uh, on the internet about the lives of these people, and uh, you see all kinds of people there. Uh, Coretta Scott King, uh, Roberto Clemente, uh, Guillaume Buford, you saw the astronaut, Helen Keller, Anne Frank, it goes on and on. And if you ever went and visited that uh, Night of the Notables, you would see so much excitement. Now, this next one is a very special story because I got to know this little boy. His name is Ethan. And Ethan was an average kind of kid. He was, you know, middle percentiles in whatever test he took. But he had a very strong interest in building things and construction. And so um, we had a, a person come and introduce all of the students in the school about a thing that we started in Connecticut, believe it or not, 40 years ago called Connecticut Invention Convention. And uh, they, uh, now it's gone national and even a few other countries are developing them. But I want you to listen to Ethan with me for a minute, and then I'll tell you his story, what happened as a result of all of this. Hi, my name is Ethan. I'm in second grade at Southeast Elementary School in Mansfield, Connecticut. And this is the invention that I made. It's called the flashing dog bowl. And the problem my invention solves is we don't always know why my dog needs more water. So this is an easier way to tell. It's by a weight sensor electrically attached to a light bulb. And when water is inside the bowl, um, and it's full, the light bulb is off, and when the, there's no water inside and it's empty, the light bulb is on, so it will tell you. And I think this is a really good um, project, um, invention because people are so busy, they'll get their attention because the light stands out, and you can see it from another room. And if your house is dark, it, the light will shine when the bowl's empty, so you're instantly not your dog needs more water. And the change I made along the way is even though it's called the flashing dog bowl, it, it doesn't flash because I was afraid that if I made it flash, then it would scare your pet and then your pet wouldn't want to drink out of it. And, and more than half of the people in the United States are pet owners. So it's a, so it's a really good invention for pets. And this is my first prototype. We have cardboard in the bowl and the light bulb, and there and over time, um, cardboard can get wet and soggy, and if it became wet and soggy, it it would become flimsy and it wouldn't be strong material anymore. So my second prototype that I made was wood, 
wood is stronger, but still over time it can rot. So um, it is better material, but it can rot. If this was sold in stores, it would be made out of plastic. And plastic is um, stronger than, um, well, it doesn't do, it doesn't rot. It doesn't get flimsy. It does get wet for dog drips on it, but otherwise it's totally good. So um, I'm going to take the water out now. And as you see, the light bulb is off. Now once I put the water bottles out, the water out, the light bulb comes on. And now I'm going to replace it with the, act, the actual liquid. <laughs> And it only takes a little bit of liquid to turn off the um, light bulb. Thank you for considering my project. Okay, well, one of the things I'd like to mention is, again, Ethan's a very a average child when it comes to his state achievement test scores and his teachers say, you know, he's not, he is not the sharpest kid. Uh, but um, he entered this into the Connecticut uh, State Invention Convention and he won first place. And as a result, he went to the national finals, which are held at the uh, Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. Now this is where a little nudging on my part comes in. He, uh, I said to the principal, does anybody about to know this, that he won this, that he went to the national conventions and so she contacted the Hartford Current, which is our state's leading newspaper, and they wrote a nice little article uh, about uh, Ethan. And uh, the one of the local news stations, I don't know if it was CBS or NBC, read the article, and they came out and did an interview with Ethan, and basically the school got a lot of recognition because they were doing these kinds of things. This is not the only example uh, to come from that school. Another great example that, again, we got good publicity on was uh, one of the children in the school uh, died from cancer, and a group of children got together, and they designed and built a garden that is five years ago. It's still there today that is dedicated to this child. They even came back when they were in high school to take care of the garden. And one of the things we fail to do in gifted education is to be our own best press agents and our own best uh, pe uh, persons that promote public, public, public relations. And I think that one of the things that we can do to get more teachers interested in this and get more policymakers like boards of education and administrators that may say, no, I've got the, the, the gun at my head is the state achievements test. We can get some good publicity on this. Now, I want to go back to Ethan for a minute because there's a poem that a teacher sent me uh, after I told the Ethan story. And the author is unknown, but I dearly love this poem. I don't cause teachers trouble. My grades have been okay. I listen in my classroom and I'm in school every day. My teachers think I'm average. My parents think so too. I wish I didn't know that because there's lots I'd like to do. I'd like to build a rocket. I have a book that tells you how or start a stamp collection. Well, no use in trying now because since I found I'm average, I'm just smart enough, you see, to know there's nothing special that I should expect of me. I am part of the majority, the hump part of the bell, who spends his life unnoticed in an average kind of hell. How many kids come home when their parents say, how was school today, or what did you do in school today? They say, boring. We don't have to change the entire school or the entire required curriculum. But we've got to build in some things that create examples like you saw with Valerie's poetry and like you saw with Ethan's um, dog bowl experiment. Now, to summarize this, we built 
a lot of our work into a thing which we call the school-wide enrichment model. And the model has three service delivery com uh, components. The first one, and really the one I've talked about the most today, is comprehensive strength assessment. And by that, I mean taking a greater look at assessment for learning rather than just assessment of learning. The second is a process for your traditionally high achievers. It's called curriculum compacting. And uh, it's a technique that we developed that asks teachers to raise certain questions at the beginning of a unit of study for young people that may already know that information and then not make them sit there while they're going over stuff they already know, but we replace it with more interesting things. Some of the examples that you were, that you've seen were when kids left the regular classroom uh, because their curriculum was compacted, uh, our own daughter being one of them. Uh, the third, again, is the enrichment triad model. And there's a lot written about that, but it's just really three interacting types of enrichment. When I say interacting, if you do a type one with students, let's say on uh, the effects of acid rain, uh, then you ask at the end, who would like to do more on this topic, or you have a speaker in, or they say a video or something on the internet, then that's where the type two thinking skills, creativity, problem solving, all of those things come in. But the third part is really the payoff for um, triad. It's individual and small group investigations of real problems. A young person or group picks a problem that they would like to do a research project on, do a publication, a performance, a presentation. And this is where the teacher's role as guide on the side is to help them find all of the kinds of resources that they might need. Um, I, I, my off the cuff definition I've already mentioned for uh, type three enrichment is the young person thinking, feeling, and doing like the practicing professional, even if they're doing it at a more junior level than an adult professional. And so, um, and this also is what makes school more fun. Uh, you see the goal of our work very simply summarized. Enjoyment, anything you enjoy doing, you work harder at, you play around with, it leads to more engagement. And engagement is kind of hard to define, but I always like to use this as an example the first time you fell in love with someone or something and how your whole chemistry changed and you were a different person because you were to thoroughly engaged in a, another person or some work that you do. Uh, I'm a bread baker. I even have a school a certificate from the uh, King Arthur Baking School to prove it. And I love to bake, mainly bread. And I'm, once I get a formula or a recipe down pat and it's working well, then I start to play around with it a bit, a little bit. How about if I try some of this, a little bit of that? How about if I do more kneading, less kneading? And sometimes they work out well, sometimes they're a flop, but that's where the engagement and experimentation comes in. It would be boring to follow the same bread recipe every time I go into the kitchen to make bread. Now, over the years, my colleagues and I have, uh, gotten together with people that are using our model. Many of them come to our summer uh, confortute program at the University of Connecticut. And I get them together in a small group and I ask them, what's working in your program? What's not working? How can you make it work? And I have, this is from a, a number of years of doing this. And I've tried to summarize it with what makes for an outstanding school-wide enrichment model program. And the first one, is total faculty involvement. A lot of teachers of the gifted often feel like uh, they're kind of left out of things. They used to be included before they became the teacher of the gifted. Now all of a sudden, everybody says, oh, you got it easy. You don't know what we have to do. And I think that uh, one of the things we need to do is to let the rest of the faculty know that doing these things can be fun and engaging for the teacher if they're willing to try them out. So that's what we mean by total faculty involvement. Now, the first thing is knowledge about the model. And we've done a number of things over the years to make this as easy as possible. 
one of the things that we have is many, many articles on our website. Everything on our website at the University of Connecticut is downloadable, reproducible, translatable into other languages, free without permission, without charge. There are some books on it, obviously, but the other thing is that we've produced a, a series of videos. There is an online course, a free course online on the SEM. And Sally Reese and I have, have also developed seven short videos, which really cover a lot of the things that I have talked about in this discussion. And they're free and downloadable, and uh, you can find them online at uh, www.gifted.ucon.edu. Look for the, uh, in the school-wide enrichment model file, look for short videos. Um, the second thing is ownership. You build it your way. I never want to see two carbon copies of a school-wide enrichment model, because if that's the case, it will mean that the teachers haven't used their own imagination and creativity to develop the program so it really reflects what they're all about. Um, in fact, many of the ideas, you saw a few of them today, the poem, uh, uh, the average kind of hell, and other kinds of things have all come to me uh, from different teachers that we work with over the years. Common goals, the three E's, but unique means that you build it your way as long as you reach the three E's. That's the key. The only thing we require is that at the end of a given school year, if we were to survey your kids, we would get a lot of good feedback related to the three E's. Uh, there you see again uh, the common goals, which are the three E's, but you build it your way. You might have some people in your town that are outstanding uh, gardeners or outstanding uh, uh, weavers or, or in their hobbies, it would, whatever resources you have at your disposal. The next thing is uh, work, hard, work smarter, not harder. And again, uh, I'm not trying to sell Renzulli Learning. They're actually giving it away during the pandemic. You might get a free trial. But I do believe you can't do this kind of teaching without quick and easy access to all of the wonderful resources that the internet and all of the kinds of things that are out there in the world that never seem to make it into our very limited school textbooks. The next one is uh, teacher and administrator trust. My gang goes out and does a lot of workshops in schools on this model. And one of our requirements is that the principal comes and stays. Many principals have that gun at their head about getting the scores up on the state achievement test. And if they don't understand what we're trying to do, it will not last very long. And so uh, we even run a separate session for uh, administrators uh, at our summer conference program. The next one is uh, celebration of excellence of student productivity. They know what the scores are for all the third graders in math in your district. They don't know some of the kinds of individual projects that you saw examples of today. And if I had a days rather than hours, I could give you, I have a whole file of all these great projects that have come from enrichment clusters and that have come from type three enrichment. And the last item there is a joyful school culture, what I call a radiation of excellence. These are the outcomes that we hope will result from doing these kinds of things. And so I think that uh, most of the time that we have these discussions, we see these things that have already emerged are in the process of emerging. Some of the people have said, we've got to go back and do a little bit more training with our teachers, especially the teachers that teach math and right answer subjects. Um, I have a wonderful example that I got from a teacher about uh, a math teacher uh, who was in, our, in that teacher's uh, training program. This was a GT teacher. And a uh, math teacher uh, came up with this activity, which I love. He asked the kids, how much is six times four? And everybody answers 24. And then he says, question number two, how many different ways can you make the number 24? And when I talked to this teacher, when I was visiting the school, he said, you know, some of the kids that just know simple stuff, 23 plus one, 22 plus two, some of the kids use subtraction, some use both 
multiplication, subtraction, and division. And I talked to a mathematician about this, and he laughed at me. He said, Joe, there are an infinite number of ways to make 24. So the kids that were really advanced in math and knew much more about it and knew algebra and things like that, they were coming up with what they considered to be unique ways. This, this teacher actually had a contest. If you can come up with a way to make 24 that no one else will think of. So I think that uh, this really kind of summarizes a lot of our work over the last several decades, really, uh, at the University of Connecticut. We are in probably 30 countries around the world, uh, uh, places like China and Chile and, and uh, Lebanon and the Middle East and many European countries. I want to end by bringing up something that it recently just occurred and it's bothered me a great deal, and it should also bother almost anybody in the gifted field. Uh, a report came out on April 19th called the Hechinger Report, covering innovation and inequality in education. And this report was based on a research study that was presented at the American uh, Educational Research Association meeting and will subsequently be produced as an article in a journal. And here's the headline of the Heckinger Report. Proof points, gifted programs provide little to no academic boost, new study says. And basically, what these researchers looked at were only achievement test scores. Uh, and what happened is a lot of news feeds picked this up. So this article comes from some news feed study colon gifted programs not beneficial a study of 1300 elementary students across the u.s raises questions about whether gifted programs observe outcomes of students and of course if they're only looking remember that continuum of learning theories deductive didactic if they're only looking at just kids responses on standardized tests well, basically, that's not what the main goal is. If we want to produce the next generation of creative, inventive, investigative scientists, artists, musicians, inventors, we've got to be able to let the public know what we stand for. Um, the person on the left is Wayne Gretzky, the world's greatest hockey player. And I love this quotation. A good hockey player always knows where the puck is. A great hockey player always knows where the tuck puck is going to be. And by the way, uh, I just did an article on this. You can get it uh, at that website uh, uh, there. Uh, the article's really gained a lot of attention. Uh, um, and uh, I believe that we in gifted education have always been, we were on the front end of thinking skills. We were on the front end of problem-based learning. We have a sense where where the puck is going to be. And so I think that if we really want to make some changes in our program, and I know change isn't easy, but it will bring out your creativity, your enjoyment and engagement in your profession, rather than always being at the bottom of the food chain and getting yet another unit, even if they put gifted on it in science, it's still another prescribed presented unit. I just ran across this cartoon. Uh, and this is a man in the hotel and he's getting his wake-up call in the morning. And the person says, this is your wake-up call, change or die. And I believe that this is what's going to happen. You saw places like New York and Cleveland and places like that that are getting rid of their programs because they can't address the underrepresentation problem. And remember, when I talk about underrepresentation, I am talking about kids that are like Ethan or middle class kids or certainly not uh, low income or minority, but their talents and their interests have, have not been recognized. Uh, I love this quotation by uh, JFK, conformity is the jailer of freedom and the enemy of research. If we always do what we've always done, we'll always get what we've always got. So when people talk about universal screening and and uh, local norms and things like that. You're always using the same damn test that you've always used. Uh, I put new stuff that I'm working on uh, up on my uh, 
a LinkedIn account if you're interested, uh, and it should pop up there. Whoops, there it is. Okay, uh, if you want to uh, keep up with some of the work that my colleagues and I are doing at the University of Connecticut, you can just sign up for that. And uh, uh, I send some old stuff out. Some, if an article becomes very popular, uh, my assessment for learning, for example, has gotten very popular. I'll put that up on the uh, LinkedIn account. And uh, you're certainly welcome to access that. So uh, we end by saying uh, thank you in as many languages as I, as I could fit on the screen. Um, it, it, the change aspect of my work has what has kept me alive, has kept me enthusiastic about what I do uh, plus years in at the University of Connecticut and several years of teaching before that. And uh, I think that uh, the enjoyment part is really what is the most important part of all learning. So I thank you for listening and I am happy to receive your questions. And thank you, Sam, for all your work in getting this organized. Welcome all of you. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. We are really honored to, uh, to have you here all with us. So last year we planned this conference real life at Hans University of Applied Sciences in Groningen in the Netherlands. We had to postpone it because of the pandemic and uh, now we are here online and as we just said uh, that could have some advantages. And one of the advantages is that uh, this conference was opened by uh, two of your colleagues from the University of Connecticut, sharing uh, how they included research on their honors program to make their honors program even better. And uh, Joseph Renzulli is really, well, you, I may say that you're really very, very famous uh, well. uh, because of your... Um, three ring conception of giftedness because of all your work you have done for education and uh, I'm really honored that we could post uh, uh, well a video a, a video you uh, you you shared with us and that you were willing to have this Q&A about your work um, in 2012 we also hosted a conference in Groningen and afterwards we created a book, The Pursuit of Happiness, or no, well, of excellence, well, maybe it was uh, happiness, but The Pursuit of Excellence in a Network Society. And you, and together with Catherine Little, uh, wrote uh, the foreword for this book. So it's really so wonderful that you are now, well, in this conference again, uh, so present. So thank you very much. Um, in this, uh, in this uh, foreword, you uh, describe excellence from an educational perspective. And you said at this moment, the outcomes that result from applying received and analyzed knowledge to the intensive investigation of issues and topics that are personally meaningful to students is one of the key uh, essence of education. So I think uh, that that's uh, still the case. So thank you very much. I, I would like uh, to uh, ask you to introduce yourself and then we will open up the floor for questions. Please, can you introduce yourself and share some of your thoughts and work? Yeah. Well, uh, with apologies for these noisy dogs in the background, uh, I'm hoping that they'll quiet down in a minute or two. Uh, my name is Joe Renzulli. I, um, a professor emeritus at the University of Connecticut, where I have worked for many, many years. And the focus of my work has really been in two major areas. And one is uh, broadening the identification of talent potential in young people. And the second is providing a pedagogy that focuses more on uh, creative and investigative applications of knowledge rather than just simply learning information for its own sake. I believe that knowledge and thinking skills have no value until we teach young people how to apply them. And when they apply them, one of my uh, areas of focus has been to apply them in areas where they have a special interest. 
uh, what I've found with any learner from early childhood to students in doctoral studies is that when they identify an area of interest, they are much more energized and they become much more engaged in their learning. And so I think that that's always the first thing that is important to me. The second is how they like to learn. People learn in different ways. Uh, and I believe that uh, looking at the ways that young people like to learn, some are more hands-on, some are more learn things visually better, some learn it through laboratory experiences better. And the third thing that's always been important to me is how young people like to express themselves. Some like to speak it, some like to prepare a, a video or a PowerPoint. Some like to dramatize it. Some like to create it into another genre from, uh, from uh, to poetry, for example. Uh, and so when we find out these things about young people, they are much more enjoyable. Their work is much more enjoyable. They become much more engaged in their work. And that's basically what is, the, to me, the, the, uh, the secret to success in any area. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the first question uh, is uh, from Ari Cole. He is one of uh, the researchers in my research group uh, at Hans University of Applied Sciences. The name of our research group is Talent Development in Higher Education and Society. So that really connects to what you just uh, told us, uh, Joe. And Ari is asking, how did your expertise on gifted education lead to the implementation in regular education? Well, uh, <clears throat> that's a really good and very interesting question. And I'll just give you one example. Uh, when I started teaching, uh, the Russians put this thing up in the sky called Sputnik. And uh, I was a science, math and science teacher. And the superintendent of schools asked me if I would develop a program for our, quote, gifted children. And by that, he sent me a list of all the children in the school. It was a middle school of children with IQs of 130 and above. However, I was a general science teacher. I taught all children science. And I realized that some of my students who were not 130 IQ were also very, very interested, very dedicated, very curious. Uh, about anything related to whatever we were studying in science. And so without telling the superintendent, I started to sneak these below 130 IQ children into my program, which we ran on Saturday morning for three hours. Later on, it was integrated into the school week. And lo and behold, they did just as well, or in some cases better, than the students who were 130 IQ. And again, I think this points out the, what I just talked about, the importance of interest, the importance of uh, engagement. And uh, so uh, that's really how I started to move from what I write about being for, quote, the gifted to being devoted to more children for development of their talent. And a lot of questions have been, uh, oh, you're saying all children are gifted. I've never said that if you're using an IQ cutoff score. But I believe that many more children have high potential. And history in this case is on my side. I could tell you story after story of even Nobel Prize winners that were considered not to be too smart by their teachers. <laughs> and yet at the same time, they went on to do great work and they're are endless examples, even in the arts. Steven Spielberg struggled with school all his life. And then when he was a young child, his mother gave him an old fashioned wind up eight millimeter movie camera. And the rest is history. He beca has become one of the greatest producers and writers and directors of film. And so these are the kinds of things, again, that I talk about in the presentation assessment for learning rather than assessment of learning. I'm not negating the importance of any test score information we can get on children. It certainly tells us something. 
but it doesn't tell us everything. Yes, thank you. So some people uh, sent me their questions beforehand, and one of those questions was introduced, and I will read it out for you. Um, there are many perceptions of excellence or honors. In 2005, you distinguished two main categories, schoolhouse giftedness and creative productive giftedness. Schoolhouse giftedness refers to what talented people learn in more traditional schools and what is shown in tests. And creative productive giftedness is the talent to influence others to create change or renewal using ideas or products. By now, the 21st century skills receive more and more attention in education. This includes the four C's of critical thinking, creativity, collaboration and communication. How do you now look at the distinction between schoolhouse and creative productive giftedness you made earlier? <clears throat> well, first of all, I always like to emphasize that schoolhouse giftedness and learning as much as you can from regular curriculum uh, and whatever our state government, our ministries of education, our lists of standards say that children should learn. There's no reason why anyone could argue against the importance of those things. However, as I've already mentioned, putting those things into some kind of actionable product, uh, creating something where they, in a certain sense, become resources for the development of whether you're making a movie, whether you're doing a PowerPoint presentation, whether you're writing a play or a story or starting a business, all of those kinds of things draw upon knowledge, information on one hand, and thinking skills on the other. But we put them together to do something with them. And I believe that um, the, the focus of my work, again, has been on creative, productive, investigative forms of what I call gifted behaviors. As often as possible, I try to use the word gifted as an adjective rather than a noun. And I know that the other things are important, but again, I believe that uh, it is really the gifted behaviors that result in some usable, functional product, idea, comic, whatever it might be, uh, artistic per performance or presentation that makes the world a better place. Yes, thank you. In the Q&A, uh, Eleanor Camons is saying, I watched your video and I was impressed by your assessment for learning approach. It makes me wonder how we could or should address this in the scouting or selection for honors programs. Do you have suggestions for us? Well, one of the things that I believe in, and we've developed a, an electronic program to gather some of this information, <clears throat> one of the things I believe any students that we serve, whether they're in school or they're in, uh, they do this, by the way, in the very wonderful uh, honors program that you heard about from my colleagues at UConn, we should have a strength-based profile. And again, that profile should include the kinds of things that I discussed um, in the assessment uh, for learning video. Um, and I think that these things should be viewed as compass points, so to speak, for teachers. When I know about these things, then I can design some experiences to capitalize upon them and develop them. And um, we developed a program a number of years ago, which has been a very successful program, where uh, it's called, forgive the title, Renzulli Learning. The University of Connecticut raised the venture capital to develop it, and they named it that way in the hope that it would sell better. Um, and the student sits down at a computer and answers a series of questions about the things that were in the uh, video, their interests um, and um, the ways they like to express themselves, executive function skills, all of that. And that information is analyzed by a computer, and the computer prints out a profile 
for that student of their strength areas. And then the computer also reads through a series of databases that have about 50,000 enrichment resources in those databases. And it will pick resources just for that profile, just for that person. And um, the program, you can look at it in long, online, just put in renzulilearning.com and you'll, it'll take you to it and you can get some information on it. And one of the things I believe is that the brand of teaching that I am trying to get people to use cannot be successful unless teachers have two things. And one is, again, a profile of specific students' strengths, especially assessment for learning strengths in addition to their traditional academic strengths, their achievement test scores. And then the second thing is quick and easy access to resources. And um, you can now with the internet, all of the resources, the great resources of the world are out there and they're, ca they're categorized. Uh, but if you go on Google, just to give you an example, and you put in ancient Egypt, you will get six and a half million hits. And so what the people at Renzuli Learning does, and this is a separate company, I don't own it or make any profit from it. But what they've done is they've studied all of the kinds of resources that are out there. And then they've picked ones that are just enrichment oriented. And so, for example, in one of our databases in Renzuli Learning, you get a virtual dissection of your own mummy. You get a scalpel and you get a hook to take the brains out through the nose and the scalpel to remove and label and put the organs in jars. Uh, there's another one that teaches you how to build your own pyramid, as well as another instrument that the Egyptian, Egyptians invented called a shadouf, which is a machine for raising water from one level to another level. And all of these are very hands-on kinds of activities. So what we've tried to do is to search the entire world of Google and find the kinds of things that are more enrichment oriented, more hands on. And there are wonderful things there. Uh, young people can take a, a, a virtual field trip to Antarctica and they can go down in submarines off the, uh, the Mariana Trench in the Pacific Island. And I think that now that we have this world of information at our disposal, all we need to do is to use it wisely. I don't want our resource databases ever to be just more print learning, more book learning, but I want them to be all very active, hands-on types of activities. So that's what we've done uh, and to make this easier. Well, thank you very much. It, it connects a bit to the work we have been doing that you can find on the website on the name cotalent.eu. Co uh, in co-creation, teachers and students created tools for teachers how to, uh, to develop their own talent, how to see or spot the talent in their classes, and how to enrich in their education. And um, what you are mentioning uh, would be a, a great add-on because, uh, well, in this uh, co-talent website, there are a lot of videos for teachers uh, how to enhance uh, the teaching and learning. And this could be a great part of it. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, there is now also yeah, you, an- you've hit, you've hit the nail right on the head, by the way, when it comes to teacher creativity. If we could give teachers the license to be more creative, I know that every ministry says, this is what you must teach. In fact, one a minister of education told me with great pride that he knew what page every fourth grader was on in mathematics in his country on that day. And I said, hmm, how do I respond to that? What about individual differences, especially interest in things? But I do believe that if we can get our teachers to be more creative, take any required subject and look at that subject and then make a decision 
about how they can infuse some enrichment activity into that subject. As a matter of fact, um, I produced a, a chapter with one of my colleagues on uh, training teachers to develop this infusion process. And I also have a, a short video I'll use at your conference next year on the infusion process and how to teach teachers because it really is giving teachers the license to be more creative. Yeah, that's that's given that's nice, giving teachers the license to be more creative. And not only I think to be more creative, but also to dare to create real relationships in their in their classrooms, that they create committed communities with their students. And that relates to one of the questions um, that I see in the Q&A. Uh, someone is area saying the key point of your lecture is underrepresentation. Which groups are underrepresented in the U.S. and how does your expertise on gifted education helps to overcome underrepresentation? Very good question. Uh, and by the way, <clears throat> this is not only happening in U.S. but in many countries that are having, uh, especially immigration. I know that the, the European countries are having immigration from the, the Middle East and from Africa. In the U.S., the major underrepresented populations are uh, African-American students, and um, many of those students are in, uh, in, in urban schools and in rural schools in the southern part of our nation. And then our largest growing immigrant population which is Hispanic students. Students come from uh, Central and South America and the Caribbean islands. And uh, many of these young people struggle with uh, not just the language problems, especially with the uh, Hispanic speaking student, but many of our African American students come from homes of very high poverty, low income. Uh, they have not had everything from the uh, prenatal nutrition to early childhood experiences. Uh, most middle class Americans begin at about two or three years old to send their, their children to uh, uh, lear learning uh, facilities, uh, children's uh, camps and day camps and uh, uh, nursery schools. And uh, by the time they come to school, they already have a good control of things like the a language and even some early mathematics. And um, some of them come to school already knowing how to read. Whereas our African-American population, uh, again, those children mainly live in poverty and our Hispanic population do not come to school with those kinds of things. And so uh, I think that this is happening in a number of different countries around the world. Uh, I was surprised as some of this work started to be published when I talked about underrepresentation. I've got uh, com uh, connections in Brazil and Chile and Africa, places in Africa uh, and uh, Europe where they're dealing with the same issue. And what we must look up at this group as is a nation's reservoir of talent. And as the population grows, uh, the uh, young people from those backgrounds uh, are, are part of that reservoir of future talent. And so uh, I think that we need to pay some attention to that because, as I said, the economy and culture of nations grow by talent. And if we're not giving that reservoir of talent some opportunities for enrichment experiences, we're losing out on that. Think of it as human capital. Yes, thank you. Uh, um, uh, I also uh, uh, think that we cannot we cannot afford to lose any talent because of the, the grand challenges, and it's uh, the talent of the of the head, but it's also the talents of the heart and the hands. And Absolutely. we, yeah. Uh, and one of the, the the challenges we have in higher education also is that. Uh, we have to be more and more interdisciplinary in our thoughts, although, of course, you need specialists, but you also need this kind of integration 
of, of talents. And uh, what would be your advice for the future? How how should we uh, well how should we make sure that we do not that we do not lose any talents anymore? Do you have an advice? <clears throat> well, again, I think that um, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, a university to begin with. Uh, we've started some programs at the University of Connecticut. Uh, my wife, Dr. Sally Reese, has been instrumental in developing um, a, a couple of these programs. One of the programs allows young people to apply for a grant up to $5,000 or an interesting research project that they might like to work on over the summer, during summer, the, the break between the academic years. And uh, the project has produced many, many interesting pro uh, outcomes for students, including some students who have started businesses, some students who have received patents, some students who have had material published uh, nationally. And so that vehicle uh, is, has been extremely successful. Another program that she started uh, with a grant from a foundation uh, called uh, Project Bold, and you can find these by going to the University of Connecticut website, uh, is for bright young women who come from um, limited income backgrounds, let's say, uh, getting scholarships to uh, come to the University of Connecticut. And so I believe that um, those are the kinds of things that we've done in higher education. Now in general education, uh, one of the things that we've done is uh, try to create some kind of general enrichment in every school that we work with. And uh, we do this in a couple of ways. Uh, I mentioned the infusion uh, project, but the most important one is a component of our school-wide enrichment model called enrichment clusters. And this is a time set aside every week in the school, usually for at least an hour a day, uh, an hour a week, excuse me. And um, the uh, young people select a topic. We usually have depending on the size of the school, um, 10 or 12 different clusters going on across the spectrum of curriculum. Some are in science, some are in uh, uh, literature, language, arts, humanities, some are in arts, some are in technology. And students sign up for their first, second, and third choice. And if they don't get their first choice this time, this round, then when we repeat them the next round, they will get their first choice. But the pedagogy of this is the type of pedagogy that I've been talking about, and that is there are no unit plans, there are no lesson plans. There are startup activities. If you know my triad model, type one, we might bring in speakers, we might have them take a virtual field trip related to the topic. Uh, somebody might do a, a, a presentation and then the youngsters individually or in small groups work on some project, type three enrichment project in which they have a strong interest, either individually or again uh, in small groups. And through Renzuli Learning, by the way, we've got some youngsters that are working cooperatively from different countries around the world. We use the enrichment cluster concept so that they work together. And um, there are some articles on enrichment clusters. Uh, we have written a, a short book. I'm not trying to sell books here, but we are that information and how to do it and the planning guides uh, and all of those kinds of things are all included. And if we set aside, why do children have physical education in school? Simple, because we've set aside a time of the school week where youngsters go to and participate in physical education activities. And so the enrichment clusters does the same thing. We set aside a time when they will go with a teacher who is interested and wants to teach and work on the project with other children that are interested. 
And so um, one of the things that I sometimes joke a little bit about is that I stole the idea for my enrichment clusters from extracurricular activities. Think about it. Who comes? Children that are interested in, in the topic, whether it's soccer or whether it's uh, basketball or whether it's swimming. Only the interested kids go. What do they do? They work on developing their skills in that area. Think of that as type two enrichment. But what's the purpose? Well, the purpose is because we're going to play in a basketball game or we're going to develop a school newspaper. So there's always in the uh, enrichment clusters a product orientation where it's the application of knowledge and thinking skills to something in which the young people have an interest. Um, I've often commented that I think they're going to put on my tombstone, uh, this guy Renzulli got a lot of mileage out of plain, ordinary, common sense. You know, why, do, why are extracurricular activities so successful? For the three reasons that I just mentioned. Those that are interested, they further want to develop that skill to produce a product or play in the sports events or present in an artistic event. Well, thank you very much. We are almost uh, approaching um, six o'clock. And so we have to finish this uh, conversation, which I really think is, is a pity because it's, uh, it's an honor to talk with you, but it's also very enriching to talk with you. Um, <laughs> and uh, I also have uh, to share with you that you are a kind of uh, role model. Uh, um, uh, as you have been dedicated your whole, well, personal, but Thank also you. professional life to education. And uh, you keep on going. So that's so fantastic. You just reach out to people and you share your knowledge and your experience. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm also, I'm, I'm sure. Very that honored people... to be with you. Well, thank you. Um, after this session, uh, there will be a break, and then in two hours' time, we will have people from Swarthmore College in our conference. Uh, I think it's nice to tell that from Swarthmore College, uh, honors education started. Franklin Adeloid, with a grant, a Rhodes, Rhodes grant, maybe now not only very well known, so grants can change over time. But uh, he got a grant and he could come to Oxford, Franklin Adeloid. And he made a kind of infusion of what he saw in Oxford, what he experienced himself. And then he became a, a, a teacher and later on a board member of Swarthmore College. And he could change education all over, well, United States first and then over the world. Well, Joe, you did the same with giftedness. And not only for primary schools and high schools, but also in higher education. So you really did a tremendous job. I know a lot of people told you so, but it's true. And we cannot say it over and over again enough because um, it's maybe an inspiration for all of us listening and working. So thank you very much. And to all the uh, well, please, attendees. Please. Yeah, please get a, a copy of the uh, article that uh, Jen Lee Sputz and her colleague wrote on the program at the University of Connecticut because it's a marvelous program and uh, other, other colleges and universities can replicate it. Yes, yes, we certainly will. And they shared also, uh, they opened this conference with their program. So uh, it's put in the chat and we can share it also. So... Thank you very much for mentioning this. I wish you all a very nice evening. And uh, I wish uh, maybe we see you this evening or tomorrow. There in the morning, there will be the conference again. We are proud from Hans University of Applied Sciences that we can have so many people from all over the world. And we really hope that you all Thank feel you. inspired and committed to change student lives all over the places. Thank you very much. Thank you.